This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. This is the first post-championship UVA basketball podcast in the history of podcasting. I think maybe, maybe not. Maybe I, maybe some other guys got some out before we did. Chris Graham, I'm joined by Zach Peerless. We were both at the Final Four, which itself is remarkable to say. And now we're both back from the Final Four. And uh, Zach, now, okay, we're both writers. Let's be fans for just a second. Then we'll get back into being serious, hardcore journalists. But uh, you grew up a UVA basketball fan, just like I did. Uh, what was that experience like for you to be in Minneapolis for the Final Four and then for that championship moment? Well, I mean, I think it's everything I could have possibly hoped it would be, just as, you know, as a fan and a journalist as well. But it was, you know, it's really... You know, you don't get a bigger stage than that. And being there, it's, you know, you get there and it's so, you know, you realize the margin for error in these games were so slim. UVA in their last three games outscored their opponents by one point at the end of regulation uh, combined. So you realize how close you are from winning and losing. And it's, you know, it's edge of your seat stuff, even if you're, you know, even if you're just there as a reporter, and especially if you're there as a fan, it was really, you know, just really cool to see. I think I wrote a little bit about it. You know, these guys have been through about the worst you can go through when it comes to basketball. And to see them come out on the other end uh, with the championship, you know, as a fan, I don't think it really gets any better than that. So what I want to use this podcast to do, Zach wrote a story that he was working on. It felt like probably all weekend, if not for the last several months in one respect. Uh, But telling the story now, I wrote a column where I sort of traced it back to being in Charlotte last March uh, for the UMBC game and, and starting from there to where we got to Monday night. Um, and, you know, I wrote some post UMBC columns talking about how that game could turn into fuel. At that time, we weren't thinking that way. We were just thinking we just saw the most incredibly awful thing we all ever had seen. But you traced it back even further. And I wanted to start with a game that the game that Virginia lost in the second round of 2017, um, Florida. And, uh, and, and, and how that maybe is even the, the sort of the, the genesis of the, what happened Monday night. So take us back, uh, Zach, to the Florida loss 2017, 65-39 was the final score. Virginia, and it's amazing to me, thinking back to that game, that Virginia even scored 39. It was such a horrible game, such a hard game for Virginia that, that day against, against Florida. But, but the, the seeds really... The, the way you tell the story so well, the seeds for, for, for Monday night were planted way back then. Yeah, you know, I kind of think you can break down Virginia basketball under Tony Bennett. And so obviously you have those first couple of years where he hadn't really established his tone, established his, you know, culture here. And that obviously takes time wherever. And it was, you know, a little bit of a slow start, but it was always going to be. He didn't really have the players to fit his system. He needed the time. Then you have that, you know, that kind of step two, phase two, where he really gets into making Virginia one of the top programs in the nation. I think that starts really in about 2014 when they win that ACC tournament, um, and they really get going there. And you can see that Virginia is developing into one of the top programs in the nation. And uh, that stretch is really good, obviously comes with a lot of heartbreak as well. Uh, you know, you think obviously back to the 2016, joy will come in the morning after they had really blown that lead against Syracuse in the Elite Eight. And then I think you get to the end of that era is really 2017, because that's where London Parantis ends his career. But that also marks the beginning, because that great 2016 class of DeAndre Hunter, Jay Huff, uh, Ty Jerome, and Kyle Guy. That was their first year. And remember, only two of them played. Uh, You know, Hunter and Huff both redshirted. But that, to me, kind of started the the, the third process of, or the third phase, I should say, of Tony Bennett here at Virginia. 
He had that first one where he was just trying to establish his culture. He had that second one where he took these under-recruited guys and did establish that culture. And then he has this third phase where he gets that top talent, and that was really 2016. But they were still freshmen. They were still guys who were developing. Um, And so I think I remember, you know, London finishing up his career, and obviously he's one of the winningest, I think he is the winningest player in UVA history. He has the most starts in UVA history. Uh, And that kind of gave way to the new wave, which was going to be uh, Jerome and Guy, and then eventually Hunter as well. Uh, And you can just remember from that tournament, it's really funny, I actually didn't see that game live. I was actually out covering Northwestern basketball in Salt Lake City. And it just felt like the, the heartbreak of that previous regime uh, was now completely gone. You know, the last guys with ties to that, with major ties to that, I realized Isaiah Wilkins would still be there for another year, and Jack Salt, obviously. There were still some of the guys, but the main guys from that heartbreak from Syracuse were gone, and this was kind of going to be the team led by that new wave. Uh, and so I think it really all started there when Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome and DeAndre Hunter realized this is going to be not only our team, but kind of our program to carry forward. And uh, so it all started in that after that second round loss to Florida when UVA realized it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite the powerhouse it had been that year. That was kind of a little bit of a tougher year, and they had a lot of work to do to get back to where they wanted to be. Yeah, that team had started the season with the influx of some talent, Austin Nichols, the the former top 30 ESPN recruit, five-star recruit, played two years at Memphis, all the talk about Nichols and what he would do. He gets dismissed after playing just one game. Uh, And so that team really struggled after that. Um, And then you remember after that, the loss to Florida, you know, there was concern over what felt like a mass exodus. Mariel Shayok would transfer out to go to Iowa State. He I, I'm not, I think he ended up leading the Big 12 in scoring this year. If not, he was among the, the you know the leaders in the Big 12 in scoring this year. Uh, you lose him. You lose Darius Thompson, who ends up at Western Kentucky, had a solid senior season at Western Kentucky. Uh, so you know it felt like, gosh, what's going on here? They 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 had a 23 and 11 finish. You know the the end was was such an end, and then you lose guys like that. But I remember, and this is now, you know, injecting me into the story. I, you know, the, the ACC, ACC ba- Operation Basketball, is the is the preseason ACC media event. It's always in late October in Charlotte, and the the uh, the, the voting for for the uh, the the uh, ACC uh, predicted order of finish. Virginia was picked sixth that year, uh, going into 2017, 2018, probably because of that uncertainty. You know, you lose Parentes, you lose. Uh, you, you know, you got a couple of young, untested guards leading the way. You don't know what you've got coming back on the on, on, on the perimeter. You know, you have DeAndre. There's a lot of whispers about DeAndre Hunter, but nobody's seen him play because he redshirted. And and I, I for whatever reason, I looked at the roster. Well, I, the reason was because these players were highly regarded, and, and and Tony redshirts guys, so it didn't scare me that he'd redshirted DeAndre Hunter, even though. When, when Scott German and I show up for the first game of that season, I can't remember the first game of that season, but, you know, you're playing a, a cupcake in early November of, of 2017, and we're asking scouts who are at the game, hey, who are you here to see? And every one of them said DeAndre Hunter. Uh, and we had heard about DeAndre uh, in practice, you know, tearing up practice uh, the year before at that redshirt year. And, and I used all that and said, you know what, I think this UVA team – is a Final Four caliber team. And, and it wasn't just fan in me saying that. It was looking at where they were from a recruiting standpoint, knowing what Tony and Mike Curtis, the strength and conditioning coach, do, the coaching staff, Jason Williford and Brad Soderberg, what they do player development-wise. And I said, Final Four quality team. And then, yeah, the UMBC loss took away the Final Four part of it, but the 31-2 and two finish in the regular season, the ACC Tournament Championship, it surprised a lot of people. It didn't surprise me and a few others who saw what ended up happening with last year's team. But then it ended the way it did. And uh, so now, you know, you've got that resurgence from that one twenty three win season in the middle of these now six years of great UVA basketball. But then it ends the way it does. And, and now you maybe feel like you're starting back from scratch. 
Uh, I, Zach, you wrote a lot this weekend about the, the aftermath of that. There was some X's and O's uh, meeting with, with Coach Bennett and Ty Jerome to go over like opening the, up the offense, and we can talk about that, the X's and O's part. But I think just as interesting, maybe even more so, was the approach that Coach Bennett took to team building. And so, t- t- and, and I think I saw that, and, and we'll talk about that later. I saw that out there this weekend when the guys were warming up before games. But the team building seems so important that these guys were so loose around each other. They were, they truly are a family. Take us into sort of that side of the story. How this, how this group of players and coaches really became truly a family. Uh, but after UMBC getting ready for the season. Yeah, so adversity, you know, can either tear people apart or bring people together. And I think what was so important for Virginia is that, you know, three days after that loss, Ty Jerome's meeting with Tony Bennett and Kyle Guy is kind of opening up and, you know, not necessarily conquering, but at least working towards learning how to deal with some of his uh, mental health issues, mostly anxiety and some of the things that, Uh, you know, some of the issues that come there. It was just a team that drew closer. And throughout the, you know, throughout the media session in Minneapolis, they talked about how they drew closer and they, you know, they got closer, they hunkered down, they worked harder. But at the end of that summer, you know, they had worked so hard and, you know, so many hours. You know, they talked about Ty Jerome shooting jumpers until they had to clean out the gym and lock him out. Um, you know, these guys had worked so hard throughout the season. DeAndre Hunter had come back because really he felt like he could, you know, make this team go further if he were healthy. Um, and so they go whitewater rafting in West Virginia, which, you know, whitewater rafting, it sounds really fun, but if you're not a big fan of water or you're not a big fan of, you know, kind of intense water activity, it's not that fun. And, uh, you know, Coach Bennett called out DeAndre and said, you know, his eyes were really wide and they had to convince him to even get on the raft in the first place. Um, but it was fun. And Mamadi Diakite talked about how he didn't like uh, going into water where he couldn't see the bottom. And obviously this is murky, uh, you know, fast-flowing water. And he said he learned to trust his teammates. And perhaps most importantly, that trust, that bonding, that conquering of fear for him and for others was huge. You know, you can't, there are all these different metrics that have measured UVA so well over the past few years. You know, Penn Palm, the defensive rating, the offensive efficiency, all of these different things have measured UVA so well. You can't measure, you know, guys trusting each other. There is no number where you can say, you know, DeAndre Hunt, T.K. Clark has complete trust in Mamdi Diakite and he makes that pass it, and then Diakite hits that shot to beat Purdue. You can't measure those things in a number, but they are the things that hold the team together. So they had spent so long dealing with the disappointment and the sorrow and really that whitewater rafting trip, I think, kicked things off. And then really the second big part of that was Tony Bennett uh, in between Duke and UNC this year, and this was really a key stretch. Uh, they had played Duke on a Saturday night, and then, you know, less for about 40 hours later, they had a tip off against UNC in Chapel Hill. They had lost to Duke. This is a program that, you know, hasn't lost back to back games in a long, long time, and they all of a sudden have to go on the road to face a very good UNC team. And, they kind of scrapped the, the, the shoot around that day, and instead they played a game of name that tune. And this is, again, where, you know, the camaraderie of the guys comes in. They had Frankie Badoki, Francesco Badoki, uh, who basically grew up in Italy, you know, pretty much a world-class piano player. And he learns all these different tunes, and they, uh, you know, they play this game, and uh, it's just a really good experience. It got the guys off their feet and maybe made it a little bit more lighthearted. And UVA came down and won that game in Chapel Hill. Um, came back with a late run. They started off really well. UNC made a run, and Virginia finished on a run. And Coach Bennett, you know, at the end of the year, looked back and said that was really a great win for us. 
considering the circumstances around it, considering that we came back at the end, even on tired legs, and won shortly after losing to Duke. That was a really important win for this team. But again, it was fueled by that game of name that tune. Uh, so you can see where these guys, you know, incredible basketball players, but you could tell there was a team element throughout the year when the team watched one shining moment, which was really an awesome moment. You know, they're playing this three-minute-long video, and the UVA players can just take it in, you know, with the national trophy, national championship trophy right there. You see, you know, Jack Hall with his armor, you know, one arm around Cody Statman and the other arm around Jaden Nixon. That's a fifth-year senior who's seen a lot of things, good and bad, with his team, with his arm around, you know, two guys who didn't play a significant minute this year. So you can just see throughout the year all of these experiences that are fun off the court really built the bonds that made them successful on the court. Yeah, I'll say selfishly now, again, injecting myself in the story for a second, watching one shining moment from the floor with confetti all over yourself with the national championship trophy uh, in the hands of, of Virginia players. It was, it was a, that was a, that's something somebody asked me this. I, I was asking a radio interview the other day that I was being interviewed on. What was, what was the moment of, of the whole thing for you? That was it. Uh, we all watch one shiny moment at the end of the uh, NCAA tournament every year. That was, that was pretty cool to be able to do it in those circumstances. But I, I wanted to say to uh, Zach about this team and how, how close they are. I was noting this before the game, sitting courtside uh, and watching warm-ups. I mean, usually people don't watch warm-ups because you have better things to do than watch. You know, regular season games, you're not watching warm-ups. You're hanging out. In a, if you're a fan, you're, you're getting your popcorn. If you're a media member, you're back in the workroom. But I, I'm there watching warm-ups, and, and it struck me how loose those guys were. I even tweeted out about what goofballs they were. Uh, UV, you know, when you when – the, the – the little stretch of pregame drills you do, you know, people come out individually for the first set and they just shoot jumpers and guys, some of the, the, the walk-ons and the, the, uh, the team managers are rebounding for guys and throwing the ball back out. And then there's a second stretch where, uh, you know, they'll actually split the court up and maybe five or six guys are shooting jump shots and another five or six guys are off on like sort of the, the, the other half of, of their half court quadrant throwing passes to each other or they're guarding each other, like making each other go through dribbling drills, you know, just some basic drills, chess passes and whatever else. And I, and I remember right in front of me, uh, I was sitting like one seat to the, to the right of, of uh, center court. Uh, and, and right in front of me, Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome were supposed to be throwing their serious chess passes, you know, because, uh, you know, I'm looking over at Texas Tech and they're doing the serious stuff. They look intense. They look like they're ready to run through a brick wall. And, and Kyle and, and Ty are throwing the ball 30 feet up in the air. Uh, uh, Ty kind of stuck his hands out in a big circle like it was a hoop. Uh, and, and he was. And, and then when the ball went through the hoop, he would signal three-pointer. Uh, to, their, to their right, I think it was Jaden Nixon was in between Mamadi Diakite and Jack Salt. And he was supposed to be like they, they were supposed to be passing the ball to each other. And he was defending them so that, that uh, you know, to make a hard pass. And they were whack. They were just you know right from the ball at his head, and he was ducking, or they would throw at his feet and make him jump. Silly stuff, stuff that you see middle school kids do before, uh, you know, an eighth grade game in October or November. Not stuff you see guys doing. I mean, you know, Texas Tech looked like they were, you know, about ready to to fight a war, and then the UVA kids were that loose. And and I think Zach, what you're talking about with that team building, how close they were. I think that goes to it. It was the biggest game that any of them will ever play in their lives, and, and, and they were able to have fun with it. And, and I think that's really important, especially when you get to those crucial late-game situations and you're not panicking. It's because you already are that loose, and you can, you can maybe play, you can play slower uh, as a result of that because you have, you have that kind of confidence and looseness about yourself. Yeah, they definitely were very loose, and you could see that even throughout the tournament when they, you know, I remember they got down early to Gardner Webb, and then during that comeback, you know, they didn't even, they didn't look tight, they looked happy the whole time, you know, even when the game was still somewhat in doubt, or at least the scoreline was somewhat in doubt, you'd see DeAndre smiling and Ty pumping up the crowd, and they just, you know, they enjoyed being around one another, and I think that's, that's half the battle, 
And you mentioned, you know, the guys messing around in warm-ups, and I remember that too, you know. I remember Jay Hoff, like, and uh, Badoki throwing the ball back and forth as if they were baseball pitchers and calling strikes for one another. Um, it's important to remember, though, that they can be that loose because they know that they've put in the work. Yes. And that's, you know, that's what's important. They can come into this game loose and ready to go because they know that they've put in the work, they've put in the hours, whether it was, you know, eight months ago in the off, you know, eight or nine months ago in the off season, or just in the hours before when they had done their specific Texas Tech preparation. Um, they, they knew that they were ready, and when you're ready, you can play a lot more freely. And that's not saying, you know, just because Texas Tech warmed up much more seriously that they weren't ready, but you could tell that Virginia felt good about themselves. They didn't have to take everything so, so, so seriously 100% of the time. Maybe 90% of the time they're extremely locked and extremely focused, but that 10% that allowed them to be a little bit more outgoing, a little bit more creative in their warm-ups, we'll use that word, that 10% can make a big difference. And, you know, obviously it got UVA to the top of the mountain. And let me tell you, it was 180 degrees from last year. Scott German and I last year covered the UMBC game. And we walked down to the court being reporters. And, and, and we were we were on concourse level access for, for Media Row for that first game. And, and so we wanted to walk down to the court, though, and sort of get a selfie, like do a little quick Facebook Live video. I mean, the kind of stuff reporters are supposed to do before a game. And, and we did that, and then we looked around and, and watched the UVA guys in warm-ups, and they, they looked so tight. Like, they were the number one national seed, and, and they, I don't know if they were comfortable with it. I mean, Scott and I kind of walked back to our seats saying something doesn't feel right. I mean, you know, you can't really explain that then when you're covering the game because you don't know how it relates. But they were so tight in the warm-ups last year, and so I just wondered maybe if there was something to that. So let's talk some X's and O's. And, and Zach, I think you were the guy that asked the question after the game that, that led to this answer. And, and I'm amazed at at how this all transpired because that, there were there was a three point three point shot at the end of that game at the end of regulation of that game that will of course go down in history uh, among many shots in this tournament the UVA guys had to hit to get to the stage. But after Texas Tech hit the two free throws to extend the lead to three, 22 seconds left, I think it was, 22, 23 seconds left, um, you noticed that uh, DeAndre was talking to the bench, and you wanted to know why. And tell the reason why, uh, because it's remarkable to me that the biggest shot in UVA history uh, was, was something that not all the, all the guys were on the same page on before it happened. Yeah, I, w I honestly wish that I could take credit for that question. I think that was actually uh, David Teal. But okay. it was a great question, and it was a great answer, too. Um, he, he was kind of, you know, looking toward the bench and asking Coach Bennett something, and David Teal noticed it and asked the question. And it turned out that DeAndre didn't really know the play that they were running. You know, it was actually a set that they had used a lot throughout the game. Ty Jerome driving with his left hand. And, you know, for a guy who's not that quick, Ty Jerome gets in the lane really often. Um, but this time that set was to get uh, DeAndre open in the corner. Jared Culver, the Texas Tech outstanding forward who struggled in the national championship game but is still probably going to be, you know, a high pick in the NBA draft if he chooses to go. He collapses down, and I still think Jerome could have gotten that layup in or at that little floater that he loves to go, but instead he decides to kick it out to the corner, and Hunter, you know, checked the and just been told that he should expect the ball, and he catches it and fires. It was, you know, it was a warm-up three-pointer. It was a practice three-pointer. He didn't have any hand in his face. It was 100% wide open, and he buries it, but... Again, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about those thin margins. You know, if DeAndre Hunter doesn't happen to hear that play, then maybe, you know, he doesn't, he's not prepared for the ball. Like, you know, UVA has to settle for that Jerome floater that brings them to within one, and they have to play the foul game again. You know, they had run that set when it was 66-65, and then Texas Tech, and Jerome missed the layup. He, he, he went for the bank shot, and it, it was just a little off. Uh, on the previous possession for EVA, 
you know, and I, I wonder if some of the confusion, you know, and now that I look back on it, that's a play that Virginia has run a lot this season. It's one of those new wrinkles. Uh, I, I don't know that they discussed that play at lunch last year, three days after UMBC, but it's certainly the result of, of Tony Bennett having having uh, adapted his offense, which was for so long, you don't want to say exclusively the mover blocker offense, because they certainly had some wrinkles off that. But, uh, you know, one thing that was exposed in that UMBC game was when guys were taking away passing lanes off of the screens, uh, you didn't have much else to go with. And so and I don't even know what they call that play or what that – but the design of the play is, like you said, Zach, Ty is not he, – he's not the quickest guy in the world, but he, he runs that play so well. He, he gets a lot of teardrops, a lot of uh, those little running bank shots from 8 to 10 feet off that. But – when, when the defense crashes down, we've seen that play run with, with great efficiency with Kyle Guy being in that right corner. Uh, Ty is so good going to his left and getting, getting that passes Guy, drawing defender help or getting the layup himself. But when the defender help comes, it tends to come from the weak side. But it's almost always Kyle standing there. So I would wonder if maybe DeAndre's confusion was, hey, isn't Kyle supposed to be there? Because it turns out, having watched the play a few times, Kyle was actually the decoy on that play. He was to Jerome's left. So when 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 Jerome, you know, made made the move and got in the lane, uh, I suppose that the design of the play would be that if if Kyle's guy helps off, then then he could kick it back out to Kyle for a three. And then if if he, if his guy stays on, great. Now the Texas Tech's got a decision. Either one of two guys crunches down on on Ty to take away the the, the driving lane, and then he kicks it out to the corner. But yeah, it's it's almost always Kyle in the corner who makes that shot. So, um, so yeah, maybe that's the confusion. I don't know. Well, maybe we can ask that Saturday at the uh, the uh, uh, celebration at, at Scott Stadium, um, as if it matters at this stage, because all that matters is the splash went in. And you're right, it was it was a practice three, and uh, and Hunter. Now let me let's talk about Hunter for for a second. Uh, Kyle, of course, was the most outstanding player for the Final Four. Uh, for, for good reasons. He hit three pretty uh, clutch pressure free throws, maybe the three biggest free throws in NCAA tournament history, Final Four history anyway, uh, with less than a second to go. But Hunter starts 0 for 7 in the championship game, goes 8 for his last nine from the field, 4 of 4 from three-point range, uh, and uh, uh, hits the, the game tying three to send it to overtime, hits with the eventual game winning three, the game winning points with 209 to go. Um, and plays that great defense on Jarrett Culver, who goes 5 for 22 from the field. Um, I don't know what else to say except for DeAndre DeAndre Hunter played the way. I I was writing columns as the season was going on, uh, and when I would write about DeAndre, I would say, I wish DeAndre would channel his inner Malcolm Brogdon and just at some point take a game over. He took the first Louisville game over, and, and that was pretty much it until Monday night. He saved the best for last. He he, he put the team on his shoulders in the second half in overtime. And, and that's why Virginia's national champions now. Yeah, absolutely. He really did play extremely well. And I wrote about that a little bit. You know, you mentioned, you know, you wish that there were times where he would take matters into his own hands a little bit more. And he, you saw in the, in the second half, he said, I can't, you know, he, one of the things that was interesting, he said after the game that he thought he was getting good shots, they just weren't going in, so he was just going to continue to be aggressive, he wasn't going to change anything he was doing, except obviously have the shot once it left his hand go in the basket, and obviously that's, you know, a little bit simpler than it really is, but he, he liked the looks that he was getting in the first half, and that's really important because in the second half, you know, you knew that it was going to have to return to the norm a little bit. You know, DeAndre Hunter has struggled, had struggled so much throughout the tournament. And at some point, it had to return to the norm. And the fact that it returned to the norm, you know, in the second half and overtime of the most important game of his life and not during his NBA pre-draft workouts is really, really good for UVA. Um, he, one of the things that was, you know, I talked about in that column is, he made eight shots, you know, 27 points on eight, eight made shots, eight out of 16. That's really efficient. He got to the line nine times. He's been Virginia's best individual scorer. But of his eight made shots, 
Five of them came off of assists, including the three that sent them to overtime, as well as the three that gave them the lead. But three of them came off of, came off unassisted shots. One of them was a long mid-range pull-up over Culver. Another one, he got a great offensive rebound and finished through a foul. Um, I don't remember what the third one was, but he, you know, when he needed to fit into the offense, and that really speaks volumes about Tony Bennett, he did. I think, you know, one one play that will be lost in the lore of this game is his three that you mentioned that gave Virginia that 75-73 lead in overtime. Really, you know, I went back and looked at that play, and there was a great breakdown of it. Someone posted a tweet with a video in it. Chris Beard had just changed his team into kind of that 2-3 matchup zone that he showed on a couple of possessions. Um, so really, really important, you know, mid-possession switch. And Bennett realizes that, and he calls for Kyle Guy to set a down screen for Hunter, who pops out. And Guy has been, the, you know, Guy has benefited from so many of those screens when he gets to shoot the ball. To see Bennett recognize that and say, hey, Kyle, you set the downstream this time and we'll get, you know, our, our player who's, you know, about to set his career high open for three. That was an incredible play and one that you don't notice until you go back and look at it. So Guy sets that downstream, Braxton Key swings it to the corner, and Hunter again comes through. So, you know, it's partially Tony Bennett being a great coach and making sure that Hunter fits into the offense in a play such as that, but you also need the players to play and be good and make shots. You know, they're the ones who shoot the ball, and DeAndre Hunter did both of those things uh, when UVA needed it most. Uh, let's talk about Tony uh, as we're, we'll start to wrap up our podcast here. And I've got to say, you know, because what can we say about Tony? He, he's, got, he's got his national championship now. Um, we no longer, as Virginia faithful, have to defend Tony Bennett. He's got the championship. We've got that championship as a fan base. Uh, but I loved you pulled a quote out from his post game, and you said it was the most Tony Bennett-like thing ever. So let's talk about that. What the, the, t- Tell us the quote that was the most Tony Bennett-like thing ever and really how it sums up. I think I think that the, the most Tony Bennett-like thing ever that he said after the game sums up, again, why I think this, this program just won his first national championship. Yeah, so he said he was talking to Jim Nance in the middle of all of this celebration and he's about to get this trophy and all these different things, or maybe he had already gotten the trophy. He says, I can't wait to go home and celebrate with my wife and my kids and my parents. Um, And that was kind of the first part of it. And obviously, you know, Tony Bennett is just, you know, a beacon of hope in NCAA basketball right now. Um, and he said, you know, that's who he is. He's a family guy. He watched his dad go through the ups and downs of the coaching profession, uh, whether he was a kid or whether he was serving as an assistant coach under his dad. Um, you know, he watched, he, he knew the coaching lifestyle from a very young age, and he knew how important familial support was. And then the second part of that quote was, and I would like to thank the Lord, and, um, you know, whether or not, you know, he has players who come through who I'm sure come to Virginia because they uh, connect with him on a spiritual level or a faith-based level. But he has players who probably religion isn't nearly as important to them as it is to him. What I think was important for Tony is that he was able to make the, um, you know, make the messages that he took from the Bible. And he had tons of biblical quotes and biblical ideas. And he made them so that it made sense in a basketball uh, in a basketball setting. So whether it's those five pillars or all of those quotes that he's given his players, he made it so that it was about family and for him about faith, but that faith for his players could just be simply in basketball terms. And that really is what, at the end of the day, Tony Bennett's all about. Obviously, he loves basketball. He's been around basketball all his life. But it was the people and his faith that got him to where he is. And so... You know, when you reach the top of the mountain, some people change. Tony Bennett, he goes back to exactly where it all started for him. I, I did like uh, when uh, the, the, this new tradition that uh, the incident of Lay and CBS have instituted, I think it's a new tradition, it seems new to me, uh, where they have the big bracket and uh, you get to put your name on the next line. 
Tony, Tony, Tony was pretty emphatic. You know, Tony's low key. Yes, he's 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 a humble and humble guy, but uh, he he smacked that. He smacked the board pretty hard when he was making sure that uh, that Virginia's name was on that last line. Uh, and and that, you know, just like the um, the sort of the, there was a great picture uh, Getty Images got uh, of him with sort of like a howl after the, the with the net in his hand from the uh, Elite Eight win to go to the Final Four. Um, you know, you don't get the level that that you get to be at Tony Bennett's level without being competitive. But th- there is perspective there, and, uh, and 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 that's that's what allowed Virginia to overcome uh, what it's had to the last couple of years. The, the 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 down moments after Florida, the the loss of a couple of players to transfer, uh, the uncertainty going into last season, the great season, and then the the big fall. Uh, and then having to rebuild and come all the way back to where they were and have all the questions surrounding them every round of the tournament, the 14-point deficit to Gardner-Webb, uh, the, the struggle with Oregon, the, the incredible shooting performance by Carson Edwards, three free throws with six-tenths of a second to go by Kyle Guy to beat Auburn, and then over, you know getting into overtime, winning in overtime against Texas Tech. Uh, uh, it's all perspective, and I think again, I think that's 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 why they're there. Uh, they they know there's more to it than than basketball, but it just happens. They're also pretty good at the basketball part of things. That's right. Yeah, they are very good, and it's you know it's important to this year doesn't happen without last year, yeah. um, and that's because you know UVA made some changes in how they would approach things. They did more on ball screening this year. They changed their offense up a little bit. They added in, obviously, some new pieces and some old pieces gave way. But, you know, you can change all those things. But at the end of the day, through the really tough, bad times, that Syracuse loss, and then, as I mentioned, the Florida loss two years ago, the UNBC loss last year, you know, the people change, the, you know, the players change, and especially this year, the plays change. You know, but who you are, your foundation, it doesn't have to change. And I think that was what was so important for Tony Bennett. You know, when when he couldn't win in March and when his team collapsed and then it got blown out and then it got blown out again and everybody questioned his coaching style and everybody questioned his players, he didn't change who he was. He might have changed some, you know, Tim tinkered with a few things on the court, but he didn't change his core values and, for you know, for basketball players, that's really important. Unless you're a one and done factory, you need some sort of consistency. And Tony Bennett has brought that since he came to Virginia. Whether it was a good season, a bad season, a great season with a bad end, he's been brutally consistent. And I think that that alone is really to be applauded. And that alone is kind of what not alone, but that is what really helped Virginia win it all. What a great ride, and Zach and I got to be there in Minneapolis for it all. And we have one more thing before, you know, before I guess we put the basketballs away, the, the celebration at Scott Stadium on Saturday at 2 o'clock. I understand that uh, the, I guess the parking lots and gates open at 1230. Um, and, and they're having it at Scott Stadium for a reason. There are probably going to be a million people there. So uh, the weather forecast looks good. Uh, but uh, but uh, Zach and Scott and I will have opportunities afterwards to talk with some players and, and uh, uh, I don't want this to end so I'm glad that we at least have one more opportunity to to, to put that put our writer caps back on bring our pins and tape recorders out and and have more stuff to to do um, but then but then then we just get to revel I, I you know I, I don't I don't know it's it's we'll, we'll and then we look forward seven months from now I guess that's the end seven months from now they'll be dropping a banner. So this at the season over. Don't know, don't know when that is yet, but that'll be another one where we get to have some fun. Well, well Zach, thank you, and uh, we'll see you Saturday over at Scott Stadium. That's right. Can't wait for it.